This is an update to the do you know who I'm story, link in the description. I was told that the reason I couldn't add any more to the original post was due to character limits. So, new thread. When I first started writing this, I would never have believed I was going to type. Update 9. Lots of news. The Bulgarian finished the job and went home two weeks ago. According to the people who met him Stefan, the Bulgarian was a good guy and a very hard worker. He did 12 hour days and weekends so he could cut the cost of staying in the UK. Based on what he learned about Stefan, David is happy that he waited until Stefan got paid before he reported the work. David was already fairly sure that Stefan was not doing the job correctly. He had checked the three firms who are the only UK suppliers of the most obscure material involved in the job and none said they'd had an order for the site. Of course, it was possible that Stefan imported it but nobody on site had seen an overseas material order. So, as planned, David contacted the local authority planning department, the client and the architect and an organization called Historic England. He explained his concerns and the easiest least intrusive way of testing. Then he waited for them to look into it. It only took a couple of days, but I can honestly say that I've never been so anxious or felt so invested in something that is none of my pissing business. First report came from the architect. Wrong method used. Wrong method using the wrong materials. He'd used a 19th century Bulgarian technique not the 17th century English that is demanded. The architect was enormously pissed off. David said he's never heard the architect use bad language before, but this phone call was blue. Apparently noisy gob crepe is called that ignorant effing cockwimble by the architect. David asked me what a cockwimble is. I had no idea. Suggestions welcome. The architect said he was going to contact the local authority because he doesn't want them to think this is anything to do with him. Most of the rest came to David's second or third hand. He knows some of the stuff from account. I asked if it was difficult to get them to tell him anything. He said they can't pick the phone up fast enough. The local authority planning officers visited the site and inspected the work. They told the contractor that the work was entirely wrong and must be cleared and done properly. Then it got interesting. The inspectors had a look around the site. They found an issue. I can't be specific about this because it would be too easy to identify the buildings involved. The contractor has destroyed part of the building. There was an internal feature that didn't look particularly important but is part of the roof structure. They removed it and put in a much better modern support. But they are not allowed to. Neither the project manager or the new site manager or staff knew the importance. Guess who ordered it to be replaced? Cheap quick option instead of repaired. Slow expensive option. Of course, it was noisy gob crepe. It's a criminal offense to destroy anything on this type of property. Jail time type of crime. Even if they don't go to jail it's a massive fine. So now everybody in that company is pointing fingers at each other and claiming no responsibility. Noisy Gob Crate has claimed that he did not give the order to take out the internal parts of the roof structure. The project manager has ML evidence he did. On Tuesday 19th the client ordered all of the contractor staff off the site. They're having everything examined. It's almost certain they're firing the contractor. They've issued instructions for bids from new contractors. They'll also sue the contractor for the cost of repairing and replacing everything they've done wrong. The architect's estimate was 800k. The local authority planning department wrote to the contractor outlining what they've done wrong and advising them of their plans to inspect and the possibility of prosecution. According to the staff noisy gob crate disappeared to the lawyers on the day the letter arrived. David had three different people from ACC phone him within an hour when the news of the letter circulated around the staff. So now we are waiting for a few things. 1. Client's inspection. If that confirms that ACC have damaged the site then the client has the right to fire the contractor. ACC doesn't get paid and they have massive repair bill. 2. Local authority inspection by conservation experts. If they've destroyed features in the property the local authority will prosecute ACC as a company and the person who ordered it. David is very unhappy because the internal structure that has been destroyed can't be replaced. In his words, that wood has been sitting there doing its job for 400 years until that effing justain comes into the picture. Then it's gone and that's it. Never again he seems genuinely sad. 
I'm betting that noisy gob crepe is wishing he'd got his own coffee on that day last month. Being on this subreddit made me remember something from last year. New to the revenge thing do forgive me if this isn't the right sub. I'm what you would call a mature student. I'm a mother and this class was 85% fresh out of high school students this story takes place in a class that is required in order to get a degree. At the beginning of the semester, my instructor assignment partners for several large assignments due throughout the semester. This was new to me, since my other classes never did this, but this professor was new, and I figured it was to save time in marking. There were 4 major assignments due. At first, my partner Sarah, not real name, was great in the first project. She did her half, and gave it to me in a timely manner, so I could add her information to mine. I'm kind of a perfectionist and she didn't mind. I thought we were good. But by midway through the term, I kept getting messages she was busy or didn't have enough time to complete her part. I'm pretty laid back so, while it did irritate me, I figured I could help her, and did most of her half. Side note, I'm friends with the ladies in her dorm, and one rumored is my cousin. I went out for drink with some of them one night and the drinker they got, the more they started talking about Sarah, and being annoyed with her. Apparently Sarah was going out to party almost every night, and when she returned, was loud. She never cleaned up after herself, and often brought back random people. My cousin at this point, said that she was bragging about getting a free ride in most of her classes, that required partner work. All she had to do, was come up with a poor excuse, that was all woe is me, and her partners fell for it. My cousin pitied them, and didn't think it was fair, she didn't know we were partners in this class. This pissed me off but didn't say anything. Third major project came and sure enough, she made excuses. I have her a lot of ways to make up time, adjusting my schedule to hers, willing to meet at the library in the evenings and weekends, offering tips for time management and nope, still with excuses. Third project received great marks too. Okay to revenge, sorry about long post. The final project is work 45% of grade. It makes up for a final exam and pretty much a make or break assignment for grades. I was done with her. A week before it was due, I still have her the benefit of doubt and she pretty much shot me down. Told me I was such a big help to a fresh student and she will do what she can to help, but please don't expect a miracle. By this time, I pretty much had the project done by me 100%. I scheduled a meeting with the professor with documents to show her of how she never helped. I gave her copies of my ML exchanges, text messages, and her admitting she didn't do anything to contribute, but if I was so kind enough to add her name to the assignment, because I'm her partner after all, I told the professor that I have been carrying the bulk of the work on projects, and while I understand Sarah is adjusting to university life, I don't find it fair if she got marks on this final project when I've done it myself. In short, I was allowed to hand it in under myself, and Sarah received an email stating she had a week to hand in the assignment on her own. I blocked her number and left email message unopened. Also, I informed her roommates to keep documented evidence on her skirting her responsibilities to hand into the office and informed her other partners on her behavior and how she treated me. In the end, she failed the assignment and pretty much the class was kicked out of her dorm. Surprise inspection by Ra found drugs I didn't know she did and failed another major assignment in another course. Her partner is an acquaintance of mine. She was later kicked out in the following semester for handing in plagiarized work. Here's another little tale from the days when I had my own production studio. My studio was located in a large rehearsal recording studio complex in South London. The studio manager had taken a local band under his wing and had given them free rehearsal and recording time in exchange for the band working in the facility, keeping things tidy, looking after incoming clients, yada, yada. Essentially, they were treated as lackeys in return for free rehearsal and demo studio time. Now these guys were seriously good, a really decent hard rock outfit who were all very talented young musicians, they also had zero attitude, something of a refreshing outlook in those days. One day, the keyboard player, Chris, and not his real name, came into my studio, and told me, that the studio manager had decided, that it was time for them to put out their first single. 
To that end, their manager had forked out for three days in a frontline studio, together with the services of a very well-known producer, in other words, several thousand quids worth of investment. Cool, I thought, and about bloody time. Chris then asked me if it'd be interested in programming all his keyboard parts for the recording. Of course, I jumped at the opportunity. We laid out a plan of action. I had a fair number of synths in my studio that wed use to supplement his keyboard arrangement. We'd record all the keyboard parts on the computer, around 20 tracks worth, and lay down guide drums, guitars, bass, and vocals on my 8-track tape recorder. By judicious use of a timecode track, we could run all these keyboard parts in sync, together with the guide tracks, without having mixing them down to the 8-track. So we then spent 4 days working, the first 2 days were spent programming all the keyboard parts, and creating the necessary voice patches. The other 2 days we worked on laying down both the keyboard parts into the computer, and recording the all guide tracks. We then did rough mix downs of both tracks for demo purposes, so far, so good. The next day, the producer rocks up at my studio, and listens to the mixes. He then states he's not happy with the song's arrangements and demands they be restructured, much to the annoyance of Chris Hod written both tracks. I said that rearranging the keyboard parts was fairly trivial, it's all on the computer, after all, but we'd have to re-record all the guide tracks. Get it done. So, another day to rearrange the keyboard parts to the producer's notes and another day to re-record all the guide tracks, all the while thinking well, that's another two days on the bilbonus. Again, we produced rough mixes, and finally got the grudging approval of the producer. Come the day of recording, I cart all the gear we'd used up to the studio. I laid down the time code track onto the 24 track on the studio, and patched in all the synth gear to the mixing desk, so that they could drive all the keyboard parts from the computer without having to lay them down, or submix them onto the multitrack. For the curious, the drums occupied 12 tracks, guitar, and bass to each, and there were 4 vocal tracks 20 tracks in total. Another 2 were taken up with the rough mix as a guide, leaving 1 track spare. While him rigging everything, the producer was boasting about how head demanded the hire of a lexicon 480L, at that time the preeminent digital reverb system, and one which cost a small fortune to hire, let alone purchase outright, about 15k. It also became obvious that the producer and engineer were old cohorts, and, judging by their demeanor, it was also clear that they were indulging their predilection for Peruvian marching powder. Three days later I get the call that they're all finished, and to come and collect my gear. By the time I get there in the evening, the only dude on duty is the tape operator. He asked if I'm interested in hearing the final mixes. Of course I am, so after loading all my kit into the van, I go back into the machine room to hear the results. I was horrified. Guitar so high in the mix it was obscuring the vocals, the vocals sounding like strangulated chickens, the drums, the less said about them, the better think flatulent warthog in a bath of custard, the bass, what bass, and the keyboard parts, that had spent so much time on virtually non-existent. I was incensed, and expressed my annoyance at the tape op, whilst reminding him, that I was not having a go at him personally. I then took all the kit back to my studio, and went to the pub for the calming influence of a large single malt. The next day I'm in my studio sorting out some stuff, when the phone goes off. It's the producer, apoplectic with rage at the comments it expressed to the tape opus. Holding the phone away from my ear, he was rather loud, I'll let him rant on until he ran out of steam. I then suggested he bring his tape down to the studio and compare it to my mix in front of the band and their manager and let them make a determination as to the relative merits of the two mixes. He bit, and the next day he shows up full of bluster and bravado. We adjourned to the main studio, and played back both tapes to the assembled folks. Afterwards the silence was palpable, the band expressed their opinion, that my rough mixes were far better, the manager, however, said that he thought the producer's version was superior. Glancing at him, I could clearly see he was in a bit of a quandary, had just dropped the best part of 4k on the recording session, and thus felt justified in his opinion, even though it was apparent his real feelings went the other way wasn't about to lose face in front of the producer. I left them to their own devices, frankly I don't give a damn what you do, as long as you pay my invoice.
The next day, Chris pops into my studio and says that their manager is going with the producer's mix, despite the band's vehement objections, and is sending that tape to the pressing plant. Fine. I said then Chris adopted a conspiratorial tone, we think your mixes are exactly what our sounds should be. Can you give me the master tape? Sure, but why? He then said that he had been tasked with sending the tape to the pressing plant, and, with the approval of the rest of the band, was going to substitute my rough mixes for the producer's version. Ooh, delicious. Okay, but on your own head be it you're responsible for the fallout. He readily agreed. Fast forward a couple of weeks. 1000 copies of the pressed single had been delivered to the studio. I turn up and go into the main office to collect my mail. Sat there is the producer who, as soon as he saw me, adopted a smug expression. He then proceeded to slap the single onto the office's stereo system and proceed to crow about his talents as a producer while expressing the opinion that I had a lot to learn. I politely listened while he ranted on, and once the record finished said, I'm sorry dear boy, but what you just heard was actually my mix. Perhaps if you spent less time indulging in the devil's dand rough, you might have noticed, whereupon I discreetly withdrew to my own studio to the sound of the producer howling like a Valkyrie on steroids. I learned later that the band had managed to sell virtually all of the singles at their subsequent gigs. Not bad for a rough mix. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video, a like and a comment would mean a lot in YouTube's world, share with us, if you would have done things differently, and don't forget to support the original authors with an upvote, links are in the description. Peace out, and catch you tomorrow.